Beth Pellman, and she's from our Senate County Tax Commissioner's Office. And um, she's going to talk to you a little bit about um, yes. the different pesticide regulation updates. So <laughs> it'll be quite enjoyable for you guys. <laughs>
there's a section to submit um, your kit pesticide use reports for ag and for structural. So this is for all pesticide applicators. Um, for PCBs, they can enter their seven-day job report, and for farmers, they can submit their monthly use report. Um, and on the other side, you have a section to submit your notice of intent. Um, if you're a pest control business, you can actually um, view other permits, um, all your clients' permits. Um, and then if you just clicked on the link to submit it in a 710, um, it's very easy drop down fillable form. It actually links to your permit information. Um, and really the only thing you have to kind of fill in is the your tank mix for that application. So it's just zooming in on the top part. Everything's dropped down, it links directly into your permit, your operator deed, the site ID, the crop, the acres. Um, you would fill in the application date and time and whether or not the grower or pest control business is doing the application. And this is the bottom of that NOI form. Again, here, this is where you would write in your uh, pesticide you used in the late uh, total number of acres sprayed for that. This is kind of neat because you can save your tank mixes. So if you kind of generally do the same tank mix throughout the season, you can just kind of like copy and paste and it makes that interest so much easier. So moving on to notification to beekeepers. So there is um, a Merced County permit condition number three that specifically relates to um, for the protection of bees. So um, when reviewing labels, like the key statement or the key phrase is toxic to bees. So in the environmental hazards statement section on the label, um, we always do a search for toxic or highly toxic to bees and that'll indicate if uh, mitigation me measures need to be taken. So applications shall not be made when the crop will be in bloom in the application site um, or adjacent borders. And that's if the crop is blooming or weeds within the application block or around are blooming too. So it's not a hard and fast rule. To, you know, there's there's kind of ways to get around uh, the sprays that you need. So one thing to do when you're using material that's toxic to bees is to do a bee notification, or what we call a bee check. So basically, um, you would call our office. We have this huge map that shows all the different um, hives that beekeepers have registered for the year that you know, they want notification about what's being sprayed in their hives. Um, so you would provide, the applicator would provide the grower name, the applicator name, the crop, the pesticides that are being used that are toxic to bees, and then the section township range. And then we go to our map, <laughs> we jot down all the beekeepers in that one um, mile radius of your application site, and then we let you know the beekeeper information. So that's usually a number, and we also have a master list of beekeepers that has beekeeper name, business, and contact information. And again, this is only if the beekeepers request the notification. So at the beginning of the year, when they, just FYI, when the um, bees come in, um, beekeepers can register with the county. Um, it's a very small registration fee, and that allows them to get um, pesticide notification, pesticide application notification throughout the year. Not all beekeepers do this. So if you're out in the bat and notice that there's other hives or know that other beekeepers are putting bees near their fields, go ahead and contact them too, in addition to what um, we tell you during your beach. Aren't they required? They're not required to register for notification. Yeah. How about your beekeeper? I mean, the bees are out there and they just drop them off without you knowing it. That's adjacent to your field. There's no contact members, there's no information. What do you do? So, in that case, is there ever, ever like markings on the box? No, the target. You can't count on that. No. Because yeah. some, sometimes, like, if, if no one knows um, whose bees they belong to, we'll go out and try to find like some marking or identification of color. Sometimes we'll ask like neighboring growers um, who that might be, and it's kind of like a scavenger hunt for us. So most of the time we figure out who the bees belong to. Because I have neighbors, we're going to spray the them out there and drop these bees off in this fallow ground, and uh, nobody knows <laughs> you know, where they're at or you know, it's, it's, it's a big pain to us. Yeah. Just if, if the grower and the applicator is doing their due diligence to figure out you know, who the bees belong to and to try to notify 
along with the county ad department, maybe we try our best to figure out who it is. And again, if we really don't know who the police belong to, we can't make that notification. We've done our due diligence. And <coughs> I understand, we understand that sprays have to happen. So as long as you, you know, you're trying our best, we're trying our best. And At that point, can't you say, okay, it's like a straight dog, it's yours now. <laughs> Well, that's different. <laughs> I, I'm just surprised that people, that how many bees they drop and they aren't properly tracked and notified. It just, it's still amazing. And then there's a problem to hide, like the farm. Has this been a problem around her where applications have been made all of a sudden, this guy out of blue now, he's claiming he's got the dead bees and he's all upset.
So some materials are toxic to bees, some materials are highly toxic, but just look for that toxic to bees spray. Another thing I do want to mention is this is still the Laura's Band label, and I've gone into the specific crop use. So this is for alfalfa. Not only are there general um, environmental hazards um, to consider, but there are specific crop use hazards. So here, this is a specific use for, uh, precautions for Laura's Band on alfalfa. Um, and again, it repeats that this product is highly toxic to bees exposed to the treatment on alfalfa. So sometimes the um, precautions are going to be the same in the general environmental hazard section and the crop specific section, but sometimes they'll be a little different. So make sure read the, the entire label. <laughs> I know it's a, it's a lot to do, but it, the labels do provide a lot of necessary information to prepare for the applications. All right, so worker protection standards. So the Work Protection Standard regulations were updated this year, and they went into effect January 2nd, and they were implemented so they would meet the U.S. EPA Work Protection Standards. So we had our first round of changes this year. We'll actually have another round of changes next year, and they're going to pertain mostly to, um, tra uh, to training requirements. So our department, we host uh, continuing education classes in the fall. Um, so just keep an eye out for the, the letter that goes with your permit renewal. Uh, this will probably be uh, devoting the class to the next round of work protection standard updates. All right, so for this, I'll be going over through some new definitions and also the updates themselves, the new things. So one thing new this year, it's called an application exclusion zone, or an ABZ. So this is, in effect, whenever a pesticide is used for the commercial and research production of agriculture. And essentially, it's this horizontal area of space around the application equipment where um, no non-handler can be. So it's very similar to the current regulation of protection of persons, um, animals, and property. You can kind of think of it that way. But it's a temporary buffer, if you will. So for aerial applications, um, air blasts, and fines for application, this AEZ is 100 feet around the application equipment. And then for um, anything sprayed more than 12 inches from the soil with a medium spray, that's only a 25 foot AEZ. So this AEZ, you know, it's constantly moving because the application equipment is constantly moving. So again, very similar to what you're doing already, keeping you know, looking at your surroundings to make sure there's no uh, cars coming on the roadways, you know, things like that. Okay, so for hand for the worker training, um, whenever the training is being given, it has to be in a kind of quiet area free from distraction. The trainer has to be present throughout the training, which makes sense if uh, the trainer is giving the information to the group. Um, the training record, um, has to list a few new things this year. The employee's printed name, um, the titles and sources of training materials, and some people use um, the, label, the labels themselves, safety data sheets, sometimes they'll get outside information from um, various organizations from the state. Um, the employer's name has to be listed on the training record, and also the trainer's name or qualifications, so what license or certificate they have, whether it's a some sort of QAL license, a PCA license, or a, a trainer license issued by the state. So field worker training, um, before field workers had to be trained every five years, but now they have to be trained every year, just like a handful. And they have to be trained before they start work in the field. And the employer has to keep the field worker training record for two years. So this is, I know mean, it doesn't show up that well, but this is an example of a template for a field worker safety and training record. And it lists um, you know, the name of the employer, the employee, everything required, and also different training topics that have to be covered every year. So this is one template that's available in our office to you know, kind of help you guys out train the employees. Field postings. So field postings are required um, if uh, required by the pesticide labeling. 
if the REI is greater than 48 hours, so that's new this year. It used to be seven days, but now it's if the REI is over 48 hours. So if you have a material that uh, restricted entry interval is only 48 hours, the field does not have to be posted. But if it's 49 hours, posting requirement. And the field posting is also required on any border with worker housing, uh, with the worker housing area. So this is just the Vulcan label, and I just kind of noted down here that there's also labeling requirements in the regulations. So for Vulcan, um, it says notify workers of the application by warning them orally and by posting warning signs at entrances to treated areas. So again, this is where we have to look at both the regulations and the labeling to make sure that we're you know, following all the rules. All right, decontamination facilities for handlers. So decontamination facility, that's um, soap, water, single use towels, and one set of coveralls. Um, this all has to be located together uh, at the mix load site and within a quarter mile of the atmosphere. So water, there must be three gallons of water per handler. Um, and this is at the begin beginning of the day. If you have a large tank of water that the um, handler uses to dilute the mix, that works too. Some people, they will have a separate container of water um, on their gator or mix rig specifically devoted to um, washing up an emergency situation. So there's lots of ways to have, provide the three gallons of water for handler. The employer must inform the employee where the decontamination site is before they begin work before the application. And sanitizer gels are not okay. They don't suffice for soap. Um, liquid gels or wet towels don't suffice for soap or paper towels. Forex wet wipes, those don't work either. So three gallons of water per person, soap, like liquid soap or a bar soap, um, single use paper towels, and one set of towels. Okay, if protective eyewear is required by the labeling under the personal protective equipment section, one kind of eyewash has to be carried with the applicator. And at the next load site, there's additional eyewash requirements. So basically, there should be some sort of system that delivers gently running water to flush someone's eyes out in an emergency for 15 minutes. So it could be 0.4 gallons a minute in 15 minutes, or six gallons of water in containers that gently eye provide eye flushing for 15 minutes. So the decontamination facilities for field workers are a little different for, uh, as required for handlers. For field workers, they just need uh, water, soap, and single-use towels. They don't need a, a set of coveralls. This has to be all located together within a quarter mile of the field workers or at the nearest point of the vehicular access. And they, um, each field worker needs one gallon of water at the start of the day. However, if they're performing early entry activities, they would need three gallons of water just in case. Again, the employee must inform the field workers where the decontamination facility is located. And again, no gel sanitizers, moist towels, or cloths or wipes or anything like that. The minimum age requirements for handlers and early entry workers is 18. So no one under 18 um, anymore. Hazard communication for this um, pertains to both handlers and field workers. The Pesticide Safety Information Series, or PSIS, the A8 and A9, which lists where records are kept, use records, um, emergency medical care. Um, this has to be located or posted at all permanent decontamination facilities, so like a bathroom area, um, and also any decontamination facility that services 11 or more employees. So this pertains more for forage operations and also to um, farm contractors. All right, application specific information. So this is both, um, this is application and information for handlers and field workers they can, they can reference on their own. New this year, the start time and the end time of the application has to be listed. The crop treatment and site ID also has to be listed on the um, application specific information. Safety data sheets have to be included. Those safety data sheets, the SDS, you can get them from the manufacturer. Um, in our office, we reference Agrin a lot, so you can pull the pesticide labels and SDS sheets for uh, all the chemicals. And 
this specific information has to be retained for two years in, uh, for headquarters records. And this is one another template that we have in our office. This is just a little chart which uh, allows you to list the pesticide, the um, location of application, the date and time of the application, the restricted entry interval, and the California EPA number. So we have a lot of examples in our office that you, know, you can use yourself or you can kind of um, use as a template and you know, make it better for your office. All right, early entry employees. So no hand labor activities are allowed in the field unless they're wearing the appropriate personal protective equipment. And they can enter to do early entry activities and an employee can enter only if they'll have no contact with treated soil, water, air, equipment, or plants. And they must also have access to three gallons of water per person for emergency um, decontamination. All right, emergency medical care. This is, there's a posting that's required um, on application equipment or at, at shops, which lists the uh, name of an emergency medical care facility, the address of the facility, and also the phone number. So new this year, the employer has to provide medical personnel with this information if they're being suspect, if they're suspected of a pesticide illness. So they must, the employer must provide the safety data sheets, the product names, U.S. EPA registration numbers, active ingredients, and for every pesticide that the person was handling um, that they could have been exposed to. The application uh, method, like the circumstances of the application, and this really helps the emergency responders to get that person help quickly. Because oftentimes, if someone's been exposed to a pesticide and the emergency responders don't know what's been treated, they can't enter the area. So they have to wait until they get the information that the pesticide is treated, what the nature of the application was. So the sooner that the emergency responders can get this material, the sooner that this particular person who's been exposed can get treatment and get help. So this regulation was modified to um, promote the safety of employees. So there are previously were pest control advisor employee exemptions for a few requirements and these have been removed. So employees of pest control advisors and foresters must now comply with the emergency medical care posting. So again, that's a, a little tag that lists the name of the emergency medical care facility, the address and the phone number of the nearest place where their employee can go to the doctor if they're exposed. That has to be posted on their truck not in a binder tucked away under the seat. It has to be easy access and fully in view. Um, they, employees of PCAs must also carry around decontamination facilities. So that's a picture of someone's bag. They have, um, this is an old picture, so it's not three gallons of water, but they should have <laughs> three gallons of water. Um, there's soap in there, they have paper towels, and they have extra scented coveralls. So scouters, um, they can carry that like just like some hamburgers do that has all this, uh, this, uh, this uh, decon stuff. They also have to um, follow the early entry personal protective equipment requirements by the legal. So if you have scouts going to field during an REI, um, they have to have all the requirements. So the enclosed cap definition, this was changed this year. So it is a chemical resistant barrier that completely surrounds the occupants of the cab and prevents durable contact with pesticides being out applied outside the cab. So this was changed to specify um, the protection of dermal exposure. So I've seen application rigs where um, There'll be a covering just that protects the top half of someone's body, so that would not be considered an enclosed cap because the um, entire body of the person could, you know, it's not covered, so they could be um, exposed to dermal, exposed dermal. Okay, so there are some exemptions for using respirators in enclosed caps. So if the labeling requires a dust mist filtering respirator, or like a respirator with a little cartridge on the front, 
They don't have to wear a bag and an enclosed cap. Uh, they do have to wear any other type of respirator. So if they're using any type of canister respirator, as a requirement, the label that has to be still uh, worn in an enclosed cap. So um, again, if they're just using a very simple dust mist respirator or uh, like an N95 with a little canister in front, they do not have to wear that respirator in an enclosed cap. So this is, um, again, back to the uh, DPR, Department of Pesticide Regulation website. This is their proposed and recently adopted regulation page. And uh, this is a great kind of resource to see um, right, you know, like new regulations or regulations they're working on. So way down below here, um, this was just the Order of Protection Standard. And they'll post the proposed um, regulations um, and all their review materials, any meeting summaries. So this is kind of a, a great little website to go to. All right, compliance assistance inspections. I know I've been talking a lot about regulations, and I know it can be overwhelming. Things are always changing. New things are being added constantly. Um, and it's really hard to keep up. So one thing that our, our office provides is called compliance assistance inspections. So that's when you, as the growers or applicators, call us, and we'll go out to the field or your office, and we'll go through um, an inspection with you, both all the requirements and kind of uh, educate you guys on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And this is um, really, really great to I encourage everyone to do this. It's great because normally when we do inspections, we're entering surveillance, and we find violations, that goes on your history on your record permanently. And then when we're reviewing um, non-compliance history, um, we'll look at all the previous violations to determine if there's enforcement action. Enforcement actions can be anything from a report up to a fine. However, with compliance assistance, if there's any violations that we find on that meeting, they don't go on your record. So they won't like lead to a large enforcement action. So it's kind of a win-win for you. That's what I think. <laughs> so does that essentially get inspected before something wrong is found? Um, again, we'll work with you guys, um, you and your employees, on a one-to-one -one, uh, basis, which is, you know, I think kind of nice. And really, it's just to protect, to make sure that you're up on the regulations and to prevent um, any liability. Um, every now and then, you know, you hear about a field worker that worked for someone years ago, but then. There's a health issue in, you know, related to them, and then they go back, the lawyers go back and try to come through these records from years ago. And if you're you know, keeping up with everything you're supposed to, that just keeps you safe. So just keep that in mind. Again, call us, because um, if you call us <laughs> before we call you, that, you know, again, it keeps it off your record, any violations. And I do want to also let you know that we have a website. We actually have useful information on it. We're constantly adding things to it. So this is our home page. Um, we have our crop reports down here. Um, I think we're getting all our crop reports and history on, on the website, so they're all Google. We have information about our apiary program for registration. <clears throat> we have a whole section about pest and user enforcement. It goes over registration forms. Um, we have our permit conditions on there. Um, we have other links, and we also um, have a link to our weights and measures section, too. So that's a good reference point as well. And that was pretty much all I had for you. Do you guys have any questions for me that I could try to answer? All right. Well, if you, anything comes up, always feel free to call our office. Um, I'm in Merced. We have a satellite office in Los Angeles, too, that we're, we're here for you guys. So thank you very much. I'm, that 48-hour posting, I thought everything that was 48 hours had to be posted. For the field posting? For, yeah, 48 hours. Yeah. No, so if you Just have above. above, yeah. So if you have a, a, a product that the RAI is forty eight hours, it doesn't have to be posted unless it's been within the label. Oh. Um, it's pretty much like 49 hours in the Posted as a yeah. All right, well, thank you. So, we've 
lot of people.